being part of so many events and another one and of obviously the ideas come from your book which you're going to tell us about and i introductions i've never done it's not going to happen so it's going to be you and magic in mediation if you want i can go through one minute of going through what i do if you if you think sure, required i think i've i've done it enough <laughs> but <laughs> whether it needs to be done any more or not i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but okay maybe there is someone sitting there who hasn't <laughs> heard this so basically everything is available at mediatorvikram.com that's where information is and this is what we are doing right now magic in mediation it's a series now can series let's have people from all over the world coming and telling us about their experiences with magic in mediation and all <laughs> to connect and everything is here the world mediation circle can is where the focus is i've been having these meetings with people from around the world on creating circles in schools colleges communities so that's for the focus areas people can read about it events of this year are going to come here the events of last year are there and 2021 and of course we have your section with all the various shows and events that you've been part of and there be a lot of them can you don't maybe realize but in the last two years there's been a lot that you've been part of <laughs> and there going to be lots more so i think that's about it there's so much more so ken it's all about magic in mediation please thank you uh well first of all thank you for adopting this idea and opening it for everyone to participate and talk about their ideas about what makes for the um uh kind of unexpected um appearance of magic Let's begin at the beginning. Um anyone who has done any mediations at all, even a few disputes, is likely to have experienced some kind of magic and would very much like to do so again. But if they're asked exactly where this magic came from, how it happened, what it consisted of, how they might uh, replicate it, they would be very hard pressed to answer. um and we can understand why because conflict is a state of being stuck and when you are completely stuck the idea of becoming unstuck has um a uh, great uh difficulty kind of even being comprehended um let alone having some idea of how you might go about doing it but when something happens that shifts that uh it just seems miraculous because for most people in conflict they've given up hope of having anything happen so um let's begin with um uh, another idea uh what do we mean by magic and by magic i think we do not mean uh illusion trickery uh sleight of hand superstition um some kind of conjuring trick that you would perform with cards um but instead we mean the very real very unpredictable metamorphosis um of impasse into resolution uh we don't mean fantasy or mysticism or what einstein called spooky action at a distance um but the very real laws of motion of conflict that have been camouflaged um that have not been sufficiently examined or understood and yet are implicit in the nature of conflict and in the methodology of resolution so uh what we do mean uh is a kind of creative act um there's a woman who is a close friend of mine who is a pretty well-known writer in the United States her name is Susan Griffin and she's written a new book which is called Out of Silence Sound Out of Nothing Something and here's what she writes I'm going to read from her book there is an inexpressible magic by which something comes from nothing a miracle of creation 
that happens all over the world, not just once, but again and again. As frequently as this conjuring act occurs, it never seems commonplace. And here what she's referring to is literature, art, dance, music, um, and the kind of creative thought uh, that goes into um, everything that is profound and new and um, original. Uh, and this magic simply comes out of our uniqueness. Um, it comes out of um, uh, a, a place that can't be fully pinned down. It's like trying to figure out, um, uh, or I'll just put it differently, uh, trying to program a computer to produce a work of art. And of course it can be done, but there is going to be something missing. It may be difficult to tell what it is that's missing, but the computer will not be able to, um, uh, from scratch, come up with cubism um, uh, or impressionism or fauvism uh, or the blue rider movement or any number of different uh, uh, traditions in art. Um, and so we can say that on some level, looking at it from this point of view, there is something magical that is potential in every mediation. Um, now, notice that the title is not the magic of mediation. It is the magic in mediation. And what that means is that the mediation itself is an opening to magic, but it isn't the magic itself. Um, and then the second thing that I'd like to say is that by magic, I don't mean something that is um, sort of fixed and replicable, um, but something that's inexact, uh, something that's probabilistic meaning it's not going to be there every time you look for it. Um, it is something at the same time that is very meaningful. Um, it is profound and poignant. Uh, it is poetic. Um, and it is sensitively dependent on changing conditions so that it can very quickly become chaotic, um, and turn in the opposite direction. Um, so what we are looking for is some kind of, like in cooking, uh, some kind of mixture of exactly the right ingredients, just a little too much salt, a little too little sugar, um, too much flour, or the wrong kind of flour, and you have produced um, uh, a meal that becomes inedible. So uh, we have to mix the right ingredients in the right way, in the right amounts, in the right, uh, at the right time, in the right circumstances, with the right people, uh, in order for that magic to occur. Um, and the difficulty is that, um, not everybody will be able to produce it with everybody um, uh, that they meet. So what this means is that the very technique that you use uh, at 940 and is successful will fail completely at 942. So how do we figure out what it is then that we're going to do? Um, and the answer is um, that it has to be intuitive. It has to come from a subtle sense of what is taking place inside of people um, that we gain by, dis by finding that subtle place of meaning inside of ourselves and tuning it as much as we possibly can to what is happening inside of them. This is difficult to describe, but this is, to me what it feels like. 
So um, the uh, uh, I want to say also that uh, having said that it isn't entirely replicable, there are things that we can do that are more likely to replicate it once we understand what the sources of that magic are. So what is it specifically that gives rise to, to magic in mediation? What can we actually do as mediators to invite this magic into ordinary conflict conversations? What do we do? So um, this is just based on my experience mediating thousands and thousands of disputes over several uh, decades. Um, and it may be different for other people. And I'm far from wanting to make this be the only answer. I wanted to make, uh, I want to make it be a kind of invocation um, of answers that would come from everybody who is listening, from every mediator. So we have a lot to learn from each other. So now, what exactly is it that produces this magic? Um, well, we can divide the magic into, I think, two fundamental categories. First, there's the kind of ordinary magic, if you will. Uh, and then there's the extraordinary magic. So the ordinary magic is, um, uh, we can see at a very, very simple level, um, takes place in any conflict uh, with what we can call the resurrection of hope. That is the feeling on the part of people who are in conflict that maybe something actually can happen here. And how does that happen? Well, the first very, very simple thing that can take place is can be triggered by the mediation itself. Um, and more simply than that, by the arrival of the mediator, that is, somebody who is outside the conflict, and as a result of being outside of it, is able to escape the hypnotic, circular, hostile, adversarial, hopeless assumptions that go along with the experience of conflict. And yet, the mediator is also inside the conflict. Because if you're only outside of it, you won't understand what's going on on the inside. And if you're only on the inside of it, you won't have the perspective um, to uh, and the, the, the sense that uh, you can get unstuck from what is keeping everybody turning in a circle. So uh, being inside the conflict means that means using empathetic listening, reframing, um, similar skills to unravel uh, this tangled ball of yarn and try to discover the deeper causes and sources of the conflict. And I think there's a third location. We are inside the conflict, we are outside the conflict, and we are also around the conflict. Um, that is, we are able to see um, not just the other person as the enemy, we can notice the subtle effects of systems, cultures, histories, biases, contexts, environments, all of which contribute to the conflict and may have passed unnoticed, sometimes just because they're so pervasive um, or subtle or taken for granted. A second miracle in mediation can happen when the parties recognize that they are stuck over the same issues. That is, they have transformed something into a set of opposites. Um, think of it this way. Um, we describe people in conflict as being poles apart. We describe them as being polarized. Well, if we take a look at the magnetic polarization of the Earth as a metaphor, we can see a variety of things. First of all, we can see 
that um, positive and negative electromagnetic forces disappear in two locations, one at the poles and second at the equator. So if we look at the equator in conflict, we are looking at the places where people bump up against each other. We're looking at the places where there is disagreement. And this is very common in conflict resolution circles. And when you get there, people will feel the polarization beginning to disappear because they're actually getting closer and closer to some place that is midway between their opposition. And that's why we call it mediation, meaning a middle way, and just like the middle way that's described in Buddhism. Um, but this middle way um, is often resolved by compromise. And compromise is what we can think of as an equator-oriented technique. That is, we're trying to find the place in between two opposing sides. And I think of that as the as the lower middle way. There is also a higher middle way, and that takes place at the poles themselves. So if you are go heading north, once you are at the North Pole, if you move one millimeter in any direction, you are heading south. And what does that mean? What it means is that there is a place of polarization in which things turn into their opposites. And now we could say that people in conflict are connected along the line of polarity. The North Pole and the South Pole are connected to each other along a line of polarity. What is this line of polarity in conflict? It's what people care about. It's the meaning of their conflict. And now we can see there is a kind of magic that happens when you get to the North Pole or the South Pole. All of this turmoil simply disappears and you are directly connected with the other person in the conflict. This is the magic that we are looking for. This is the higher order um, of uh, uh, resolution. And it is what I think of as the higher middle way. Um, uh, so there is uh, the, this, this kind of miracle as well. Um, we can also um, uh, find a different kind of ordinary, what I think of as an ordinary form of magic, um, simply by helping people calm their emotions, um, by listening to them, uh, by modeling mediating, uh, uh, mediative skills, by drawing them into conversation or dialogue with each other by acknowledging the legitimacy of each of their separate understandings of what is true. Uh, a mediator can help people explore the nuances and the subtleties uh, in their various experiences. Um, a mediator can surface uh, interests um, uh, and suggest you know, novel, creative, collaborative solutions. Um, I still think of this as a kind of ordinary magic, um, a kind of day-to-day -day magic, the kind that uh, Susan Griffin was talking about. Um, and uh, I think that there is also um, a, a deeper, a uh, still deeper place that may also be a kind of ordinary magic, which is um, uh, helping people figure out what they can learn from their conflict, how their conflict is pointing them in the, dire them in the direction of growth and improvement, how it is creating openings into insight and awareness um, uh, and empathy, um, uh, pathways even into uh, a kind of deeper, uh, what we could call heart knowledge. 
But in addition to these, you know, what I think of as ordinary miracles, um, there are a series of others that are much more profound and less common. Uh, so when I say ordinary, I don't mean a, not useful. I think they're incredibly useful and they do result in magic. These ones, however, are largely recognized and known. And we understand a lot of the techniques that help to create them. Where we fall short in techniques is with a series of others. And I have come up with 15 uh, of these. And I'll just list a few of them and then I'll go through a couple of them to whatever extent we have time. But each one is a little complex um, and requires some imagination to figure out exactly what we do in order to create it. So what are some of the places where magic occurs where we want to kind of uh, backwards engineer a set of techniques? based on what it is that somehow happens. The first of these is what I call a shift in awareness, an attitude, uh, in emotions even, or thought, uh, a shift in intentions. Um, and this isn't just a question of listening. It's a shift that takes place inside people as a result of listening. Um, where they all of a sudden become aware of the fact that um, they may have been mistaken. They may have assumed something uh, that wasn't actually true. Um, and there's a second one which is similar, but is a little bit different, which is um, uh, some fresh insight, uh, some new realization, some unanswered question some um, imaginative leap uh, that takes place in the ways people are thinking about their problems. And we see this often in conflict resolution, but the question is, how do we do this? How do we get there? And a third, and then I'm gonna describe this one and go back and say a little bit about some of the others, but I'll give a little bit of a description of this one. This is a little bit more complex and it is what, um, I recall an added dimension or degree of freedom, a kind of uh, uh, opening into an entirely different world. Now, let's describe this a little bit. What is a dimension? Well, we know, we have some sense of what a dimension is. We live in a world in which there are three dimensions four including time, if you go to Einstein's uh, contribution um, and what is called Minkowski space-time. Um, uh, but let's assume we're talking about three dimensions, uh, plus, of course, zero. Uh, there are two mathematical definitions of a dimension. First, how many pieces of information do you require in order to know where something is located. Zero, it's a point. One, it's on a line. Two, it's on a plane. Three, it's a cube. Um, and the second, which is more interesting, mathematical and physical definition of conflict is that it is a degree of freedom. And this is the one that is the most interesting. So, at zero dimensions, at a point, there are zero degrees of freedom. You can't move at all. There's nothing you can do. There's nowhere to go. In one dimension, you can move along in one direction. Uh, and that constitutes a line, a number line, uh, so that you can actually mark off uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, uh, and distinguish between different places on that line, even if there are an infinite number of numbers and an infinite number of spaces between numbers. Still, it, they're all on a line. Now, if we think about what happens to conflicts inside of organizations, sometimes inside of families, and we ask, what is the dimensionality of those conflicts? Um, the question is, uh, where do you, uh, 
have to go in order to be able to get an answer to your question. How many pieces of information do you need? And in many organizations that are severely hierarchical, you just need one piece of information, what the boss wants. In families, it's what dad wants or mom wants. Um, that's one degree of freedom. Now, um, when, but if you have, if you're in a family and dad says, this is what's going to happen and you have a teenager, um, all of a sudden you've got two degrees of freedom. You've got what dad wants and what the teenager wants. And that's going to create a resolution plane. That is, um, the uh, if you take as the x-axis horizontal, what dad wants, and the y-axis or vertical, what the teenager wants, every place on that plane will be a compromise that isn't on one of, the, or of those two axes. So compromise arises naturally as a result of a two-dimensional approach to problem solving. Uh, what is the third dimension? The third dimension could be emotions. It could be interests. We could add any number of different dimensions that we want here. So let's say that um, uh, we have a conflict that is deeply emotional. And the only information that we have is what dad thinks and what the teenager thinks. What's going to happen? And the answer is you're going to have a very hard time resolving that conflict because there is a third dimension to the problem and you're using a two-dimensional approach. And it's just kind of that simple, except that it becomes more complicated as we go along. So we can say, let's say the third dimension is, is emotion. A fourth dimension now is interests. How do we get to emotion? How does it feel? So by asking the question, how does it feel, we create a third dimension um, and give ourselves a freedom of movement and an ability to define where the conflict is located that we did not have at two dimensions. And um, we will predictably get stuck more often if we approach conflicts from a purely two-dimensional approach rather than introducing this third dimension where emotions are involved. What's an example of a two-dimensional approach to conflict resolution? The law. Courts of law are exactly two-dimensional. You only need one piece of information, uh, two pieces of information, what the plaintiff wants uh, and what the uh, defendant wants. And now the judge is going to decide who's going to win and who's going to lose. Except the judge doesn't have the ability to compromise unless they go into a kind of settlement negotiations. The judges, and I speak as a judge, uh, I've been a judge and I still work as an arbitrator, which is a kind of judge. Uh, the, the judge has to decide who's right and who's wrong. And if you ask the question, how does that feel? the judge is going to say that's irrelevant. Let's get to the facts. So uh, that's an example of how courts of law have their hands tied behind their backs in trying to resolve disputes because they can only work with two degrees of freedom. Now, how many degrees of freedom are there? Well, there's a mathematician whose name is Riemann who said they're an infinite number, and that's entirely possible. Uh, but now let's imagine what some of those might happen to be. Well, once again, if we create now a, uh, we imagine uh, a, 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 a point, which is zero dimensions, how does a point become a line? And the answer is you turn a point into a line by dragging it 90 degrees in a brand new direction. And you turn a line into a plane by taking a line and dragging it 90 degrees in a brand new direction. And you take a plane and make it into a 
cube by dragging it 90 degrees in a brand new direction. So what is this dragging 90 degrees in a brand new direction? It is asking a question that lies outside the parameters of the dimensionality that you have been operating in. Asking a question that cannot be answered with a two-dimensional answer. And now we go to a cube, and what's next? A hypercube. Um, and if you'd like, uh, I can actually show you what this looks like. Uh, let's see, can I share? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I, I put this up in order to be able to see whether this might be of some interest uh, to people. Let me put this up into, here we go. Okay, so here's uh, my take on it. It is um, dimensions um, uh, of conflict resolution. I just put zero dimensions, what happens when you have no freedom of movement. There's impasse, chaos, anarchy, nothing gets settled at all. One dimension, is power-based, dictatorial, it's my solution. And it's factually informed, but what you get as an outcome is obedience. Uh, two dimensions is a rights-based approach, it's adversarial, uh, what you, what, what, what the technique that you use is compromise. Instead of factually informed, it's legally informed or rule informed. And what you get is acceptance. And now if we, instead of talking about emotion, we talk about interests as a third dimension. Um, this is, these are interest-based, they're collaborative, they're emotionally informed, uh, and what we reach is consensus. And down at the bottom here is a hypercube. Uh, and it took me an hour to draw that, so I really want you to appreciate that drawing. And you can look at it actually for a long time to try to figure out what the heck this is. I think of this as heart-based, but we can have any number of different ways of describing it um, because each one is additive. Um, and with each new dimension, um, magic occurs. So if, you, if you're on a line and you look back at somebody who lives on a point they could never understand what it is that you're doing. The introduction of the line is magic. The introduction of the plane to the line is magic. And if you live on a plane, just to take a, a concrete example, we live on a plane and now we have this cup of tea uh, that's on the, on the plane um, and the tea is resting on the plane. What do people on the plane see? And the answer is a circle. If you ask them what's inside that circle, they could never answer you. But from a third dimension, it's easy. You just look in and you can see. But that looks magical to someone on a two-dimensional plane. And there's a wonderful novel written about this called Flatland by Edwin Abbott, uh, written in the 19th century, uh, which is quite wonderful. But the point of this is um, there is magic in adding additional dimensions. How do we add additional dimensions? We ask a question that is outside of the frame of reference of the parties um, and is at a 90 degree angle to what they're talking about. So a plane is at a 90 degree angle to a line. Um, a cube is at a 90 degree angle to a plane. What's the 90 degree angle? in conflict conversations? And the answer is that uh, it is something that cannot be answered within the frame of reference that the parties have. It is outside of that frame of reference. Why do you care so much about this? Uh, what does this mean to you? Have you ever experienced this before? Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There are a whole series of things, and we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, but the point of this is, each new set of techniques gives us an additional degree of freedom. Um, there's another uh, source of magic in mediation, uh, which is uh, any kind of 
change in the form of the conflict. That is a transformation. And what does it mean to transform a conflict, to change its form? Um, mediation is already a transformation in a conflict. And within the mediation, it is possible to have multiple transformations. The transformation from yelling and screaming at each other to sitting down and talking. That's an immense transformation. Uh, the transformation from asking, from uh, telling people to asking questions, uh, etc. There are a series of those that we can look at. Um, and uh, they, what they point to is uh, what I call the art of asking questions. And there are a whole series of things, um, powerful, intense questions. Uh, here's one is one of my favorites. Um, what question, if it were uh, answered, um, would mean the most to you right now? Uh, what question would you most like the other person to ask you right now? Try this in your family. Try it with your spouse. What question would you most like me to ask you? and see what happens. Um, the chances are good that you are going to see a transformation, a change in the form of your conflict. How many of those are there? Thousands, uh, an unlimited number possibly. Uh, and here what we can do is we can change the form of the conflict, for example, by building small collaborations into the mediation process, um, setting ground rules. That's a collaboration. It's a very small one, but it has meaning. We have now met together. We've agreed to meet together. That's a collaboration. And now we're going to agree on how we're going to talk to each other. That's a collaboration. Um, and now we can do other collaborations. Um, uh, how do you think we might answer this question? What resources could we look to to help us figure out what is the best solution here? Um, so for example, we can do uh, collaborative research. One of my favorite techniques here uh, is what I call conflict mapping. And in conflict mapping, what we do is, what I do is I'll take a flip chart or multiple flip charts uh, and I will say, okay, what is the very first thing that happened in this conflict? Very first thing. Um, A yelled at me. This is from B. Okay, so that's the very first thing. Um, what did B do after A yelled at him? Or after what did A do after B yelled at him? Um, well, A yelled back. Okay, now we can begin to plot and see how, where this thing goes. But now we can go back and say, what happened just before B yelled at you? And B will say, A insulted me. Well, why did A insult you? And now we're, built, we're going backwards in the history and the mapping. And if you put all this on a flip chart, or you put it on butcher paper on the wall, and we can do this in organizations as well as with individuals. They, what you will then ask them is, okay, now go over this map and insert opportunities for responses that could have bypassed what happened next and made that more, you know, sort of friendly or conflict resolvable. Uh, and it's a very, very powerful technique. Um, you can identify each point where something was said or done that impacted the conflict, either positively or negatively, where something was not said, not done, but could have done, uh, been said or should have been said or done that could have stopped the conflict. Um, uh, and we could also ask, uh, what did it cost you? Um, to experience this yelling. What price have you paid for that? 
Now that's a fundamentally different kind of question, but we can put that sort of information down as well. Uh, and now there's another piece that we can look at. This is a partial example. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, he's a science fiction writer, science fiction novelist. Um, he made a very famous statement that uh, in quotes, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So we know this because we're living right now with uh, GPT-4, uh, chat GPT. I don't know if you've used those, Vikram, but uh, they're very, very powerful uh, technologies. Um, but we can see how the computer, the internet, smartphones, earlier than that, uh, telegraph, radio, television, even earlier than that, et cetera, how these inform the way people communicate, the way that they relate, the way that they interact with each other, and they expose cracks and fault lines, each one of them that requires a fresh set of skills and gives rise to new forms of conflict. So um, one of the uh, difficulties with chat uh, and uh, all the other various forms of large language, uh, you know, kind of uh, AI systems uh, is that they tend to replicate um, racism, uh, homophobia, uh, uh, gen, uh, uh, misogyny, uh, biases, prejudices of various kinds. And you can find these popping up. And the reason is because they learn from, um, these AI programs learn from what's already on the web. And so what we require is a new kind of orientation to this technology. Um, and it is possible now to think also in terms of conflict resolution technologies. Um, uh, there's another uh, science fiction writer uh, whose name I've just forgotten. Um, um, Gibson, William Gibson, uh, who said that um, uh, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And I think we can, in a similar way, say that conflict resolution technologies are also unevenly distributed and often unavailable to people who are most in need. Um, but what we are looking for now are some techniques like conflict mapping as an example, which is I adapted from process mapping, which is used in management very commonly, um, and adapting uh, methodologies from, for example, um, uh, psychology and the study of trauma. Um, every conflict creates a kind of results in a kind of trauma. Uh, I wrote a book called The Crossroads of Conflict, and in that I have a, there's a chapter called Why Every Conflict Breaks Your Heart. But it's also possible to describe it as a trauma, a wound. And now what that means is we can bring in to conflict resolution a set of trauma-informed uh, practices. And in Mediators Beyond Borders that as you know, I've been working with. Uh, we have had a project in Rwanda where everybody has been traumatized and every conflict re-aggravates, re-stimulates the trauma. So what we've had to create is something called trauma-informed mediation. That is, we're not just interested in resolving the issues over who gets what or you know, who's in charge here and who isn't. We're also interested in trying to reduce the level of trauma that has emerged as a result of the conflict. And there are a set of techniques that are available uh, to do this. Now, a word uh, about technique, because this is also a kind of um, magic. 
Um, every new higher order technique, skill, aptitude, capacity uh, can create magical outcomes. So um, the skills that are needed uh, to crawl as a baby are not the same as those that are needed to walk. And the ones needed to walk won't get you to a place where you can compete in track uh, and field competitions. Um, and these skills are not just additive, they're multiplicative or exponential. And the same is true with regard to conflict resolution. The skills start off very small. Can we talk? Can we stop the fighting? But at each new level or layer of resolution, higher order skills are required. And once they are acquired, what happens is not only do the conflicts that you're involved in dissipate and begin to disappear, you cease to get into conflicts over any similar issues forever, as long as you have those skills. So um, take babies as an illustration. Newborn babies, um, if you put them side by side with each other, they probably they don't even know the other baby is there. But at a certain point in time, they become aware of the fact that there's another baby there and they want to play with the other baby. And if the other baby takes the toy away from them, uh, they'll cry uh, and be upset uh, because they don't know what to do about it. But as soon as they begin to try to figure this out and want the relationship, they move from what is called parallel play uh, into interactive play. And in interactive play, what they discover is how to say, um, pass me the toy, and then I'll pass it back to you. And we can pass it back and forth with each other and have fun doing that. That's a higher order of skill. And what that means is those babies never have to lie there and cry because they don't know what to do anymore. They now know what to do. But now that's just the first step out of being a baby in conflict resolution. And now we've got multiple, multiple steps. And what does that technique represent, therefore? It represents the evolution of the conflict to a higher form as a result of the acquisition of a higher order of resolution technique. Does that make sense? So in other words, um, teenagers and parents will fight with one another uh, because they don't know how to have a conversation about the issues that divide them uh, in a civil way. But once they have separated and are living apart, they can actually begin to have a relationship with one another again if they're able to develop the techniques of being able to listen and acknowledge and understand and recognize that there is a system, a family system that is at work here, which has two fundamental components, individuation and integration. No individuation, you're lost as a human being. All individuation, no, in, no integration, there's no family. So what we're required to do is to figure out how to balance individuation and integration. The problem is there isn't one balance. There's a constant balance. It's a razor's edge problem as described by Somerset Maugham in a novel that he wrote with that title, meaning there is no balance. You have to constantly be balancing. And what that balance consists of is um, a set of capacities. The capacity of being able to listen to someone say something negative about you and not get plugged in. Um, and, this, and of course, that requires that you be able to do the same with something positive that someone says about you. Um, but the point of this is, for 
parties in conflict, what this means is, and this was another, the title of another chapter in the book, The Crossroads of Conflict that I wrote. Um, the title is uh, Conflict as a Spiritual Crisis. And every conflict is a spiritual crisis. That is a crisis of direction, a crisis of meaning, a crisis of your capacity for awareness and authenticity. And if that's the case, what is a mediator? Well, that makes the mediator a kind of spirit guide, a kind of guru, right? Um, and yet it has to be a kind of guru who passes on uh, the teachings um, to the people who are um, having the difficulty. So uh, this is complex, but this is magic. Uh, and that magic is incredibly powerful. So there's a lot more um, that we could talk about, but it looks like we're starting to run out of time. Um, there are, uh, let me just mention a couple of other items that are also um, potential sources of magic. Um, some new symmetry or synthesis or creative combination of already existing ingredients. So if we can find symmetries between what people are working with or syntheses by combining them together in creative ways. Um, another one is a recognition of hidden sources, connections, meanings. Um, another one is a, a paradigm change a paradigm shift, a, a phase transition, uh, a shift from, you know, sort of uh, one way of thinking to another way of thinking. Uh, this is a kind of revolutionary um, shift that takes place in the ways that we think about each other. For example, um, looking at the ways that we create enemies and how we can do that differently. Uh, I think it is also um, that uh, uh, magic happens when people discover that place of balance and authenticity, the place of center, integrity, the place of integration inside themselves. And when they discover that place and, and really uh, learn how to uh, get there, partly as a result, in my view, of meditation. Uh, but when they find that place, they become uh, no longer reactive to conflicts in a way that they once were. Uh, another uh, sort of source of magic is any increase uh, in uh, love, caring, kindness. Um, any way in which people express acknowledgement, um, forgiveness, uh, caring about what the other one went through or experienced can have a fundamentally transformational approach. Uh, many years ago, I, um, I was doing a lot of work with collaborative practitioners, that is lawyers who agree to collaborate with one another. And I was the mediator where the parties and the lawyers were present trying to figure out what do we do about this. And in one of those mediations, collaborative practice mediations, um, the lawyer for the husband turned to the wife and said, you know what you said, is really powerful. Um, I love that. That is a really beautiful way of describing the problem. And I accept that completely. And she just melted. She did not expect anybody, let alone her husband's lawyer, to say something like that to her. And it, it was a small thing. And every one of these things can be done in a very small way or a very large way. And the final one I want to mention is what I call the metamorphosis of experience 
into heart knowledge and wisdom. So the acquisition of wisdom is a kind of magic and it comes out of conflict because what wisdom consists of is the ability to rise above the conflict. And there's a wonderful statement by Carl Jung uh, who described this with regard to problems. He says that um, with regard to problems, it's not so much, uh, or conflicts, it's not so much that we uh, resolve them or solve them, we outgrow them. So that from the point of view of our new self, which is at the mountaintop, we can look down on the conflict as though in the valley below. And I think there is a truth about this. We have outgrown conflicts with kids on the playground over who gets to play with which toys. We haven't resolved those conflicts, we've outgrown them. How? We've learned a kind of wisdom. And I think that wisdom is essentially the same as heart knowledge. So how does experience get metamorphized or meta metamorphosized, I'm not sure what the word is here, uh, into heart knowledge and into wisdom? Well, once again, I think there are techniques that we can use in order to be able to do this. So uh, I guess I've more or less run out of time. You've never, uh, never run out of time, but yes. <laughs> In this case, maybe the time is up, but it's never up. Again, it's always up to you. You can always take it forward. But when is the book coming out? Well, I am right now halfway through the second to last chapter. All the other chapters have been done, more or less. So I have two chapters to go. Um, the chapter I'm working on right now is on economic conflicts. And the last chapter uh, is called... Uh, conflict is dead, long live conflict. <laughs> but, so, uh, yeah. uh, but there are chapters on um, the metaphor of mathematics, uh, on literature, uh, on conflict as a change process, um, and mediation as a change process. So what, do, what can we learn from other change processes about what is actually going on, uh, et cetera. And do we have a chapter so, on a chapter? My on hope who, is, yeah. Sorry. Do we have a chapter on who is the magician? Yes, there is. There is. <laughs> uh, a chapter. Uh, let's see. What is it called? Um, uh, mindfulness, mediation, mindfulness, med meditation, and mindfulness. Uh, so that and that's different from the other piece that I wrote before about um, uh, mediation and meditation. It's a little bit different. Anyway, I'm hopeful that it will be out by the end of the year. Uh, I've got to do some editing, and then I now have to find a publisher. I, I, I thought you had the publisher. Uh, well, the there was tentative talk, but we haven't actually nailed anything down yet. Okay. But now you spoke about chat GPT. I'm thinking I'm going to call chat GPT as one of the speakers in my symposia, all the symposia that I do. I had Wonderful. planned to do it in the language and mediation, but then... I didn't, but I think Chad GPT should be invited. I think it deserves to be invited with the vast knowledge that it has. But but I, I, I don't know, the fourth dimension, the heart part of it, I think we have to also have one diagram on the spiritual part of it also. Yes. One well, there is, a, yes, I, the spiritual part is, in, in my way of thinking, I sep also separate spiritual uh, the spiritual location of conflict from the heart location. Because what you would do would be two fundamentally different things. I consider part of the spiritual path uh, the ability to let go of what you're holding on to. And if you're holding on to conflict, letting go of it means forgiveness. But what heart means is reconciliation. Opening your heart to the other person again. Absolutely. That's a different dimension altogether. I mean, it's a totally different dimension. Completely different dimension. Completely be, different dimension, yes. Lots of exploration has to happen. But Ken, if you have two minutes, let me just go through some comments that people have got. Nuria, she's in Spain. 
good evening is what she says. There's Hebron in Kenya. Who's, of course, there is Maria in Brazil. I think you met Malu. I don't know whether you met her. She's saying good afternoon. Sophie says she's in Canada. Reverse engineering can lead to extraordinary results, yet it needs faith and work. Any comments on that, Ken? Yes, I agree completely. Okay, that's a good comment. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the, there is, a, uh, we, we can unpack these words, uh, what faith actually means. Um, and I think that if we think of faith as hope, uh, or rather as an, a deep understanding of the nature of conflict so that the, uh, the possibility uh, of magic uh, is always present with us. And work meaning that we always keep that in front of us as our intention and we strive for it. We aim for the conversations in which transformation is possible. Elizabeth, obviously, oh. Elizabeth always has a little longer comments, but I love this concept of magic and mediation. I believe that the magic of mediation consists of adjusting perspectives and having the opportunity to see what is not obvious. Mediators have the power to influence the course of events that can be magical. Magic is reflected in the changes resulting from the mediation. Magic is also reflected in transformation and healing. Imagination and insight can be magical. Basically, magic involves finding an equilibrium of energies. And Brilliant. Yes, I would suggest that you invite this person onto the program to discuss these points. Yeah, okay. everyone is look, everyone's going to be invited to talk about media, magic and mediation. So I'll call Elizabeth will also be invited. But I have to decide that. I have to decide whether only the people who are part of the world mediation circle. Else we'll say that. Trisha, Trisha is saying aloha from Maui. And, uh, is, and Vitali aloha. is saying <laughs> aloha back. And then there is Vitali. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and skills. That's what it is. So, but, but what about our we are viewers also supposed to talk about certain things after this session? Whether you'll find time for that or not, we'll see. But are, are we done for the yeah, session now? Yeah, let's yeah, let's close it here. So thank you very much, Ken. And of course, mm -hmm. the other events that are coming up. The one thing that's coming up next is, of course, the I mean, symposium on mediation legislation. You're having a discussion on that. That's that's for me now. It's I think it's an important part needs to be discussed. In. Yeah. Uh, have you invited Ron Kelly yet? No, no one has been invited. I mean, in the sense, I've spoken to two people only. The yesterday is when I decided that I should do this. So okay, so I will take Ron, the name Kelly, Ron Kelly in California has been doing this for ages. Perfect. So we must get him in. So anyway, so what I'll do is let me stop the recording and the live stream, and I'll just have a conversation with you. So thank you, Ken. Always a pleasure, and Always. thank you for being part of events.